Our first uh, speaker tonight is going to be introduced by Pete Smith. So, Pete, you're on. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Dave Bukowski is our speaker, our leadoff, and uh, Dave is the president and director of the Wiscasset Waterville and Farmington Railway Museum in Maine. Under his leadership, the WWNF has experienced uh, some really unprecedented growth to include extending its right of way, acquisition of a, an historic Howe Pony Trust covered bridge, construction of a turntable and an engine house, and an ongoing new build of a WWNF number seven, which is a 1907 Baldwin 244 Forney, just to name a few of the projects. These are busy times at the Wiscasset. Dave makes his home in Massachusetts, where he's a senior executive with the Chicago Title Insurance Company in Boston. With that, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Railroad, talk about current affairs and uh, give you a vision uh, for where we're headed tomorrow. Narrow Gauge Railway ran through the Sheepskit Valley. Uh, it was constructed in 1894 to join the harbor at Wiscasset, Maine, with Quebec City. Uh, the village of Wiscasset was situated on an ideal harbor, um, one of which remained ice-free throughout the year. It was, um, so I'm told, the third largest harbor north of Boston. Um, and it was a reasonably deep water port. Um, since the time when it was um, around the War of 1812, it had fallen into somewhat disuse and was and the uh, local local burgers wanted to uh, wanted to extend that and increase some business. So they thought bringing a railroad uh, from Wiscasset to Quebec City would be a great idea because um, Quebec City did not have a deep water port that was ice free uh, in the winter. Why isn't this moving? Oh, there we go. Um, construction costs for a narrow gauge railway are roughly one fifth of the standard gauge um, a railroad. Um, you can see there's a, I don't know if it's big enough, but the numbers uh, off to the right there. Uh, it initially started, as I'm sure most of you know, in, in Wales, a man by the name of George Mansfield brought the concept to the United States um, in Massachusetts, uh, just down the street from me in the Bedford and Billerica. Um, it lasted about nine months because it wasn't making enough money. Uh, and soon uh, it was packed up and moved to the Sandy River region up in Maine. From there sprouted a total of five railroads. Uh, in addition to the WWNF, there was the Sandy River or Rangeley Lakes, which was made up of a number of uh, different railroads that were all corporately owned together. Bridge and Saka River, the Monson Railroad, so so called two by six, uh, which was used for the to haul Monson slate from the quarry to um, the main central, and the Kennebec Central Railroad, which served the soldiers' home in Togus, uh, mainly uh, toted uh, soldiers and sailors, excuse me, to their medical appointments and brought them back slightly inebriated. It also brought coal there. The railroad initially made its way up to Albion and then beyond as far as Burnham Junction, which is about five miles north of Albion. <clears throat> At that point, it would have had across the main central, but the um, railroad commissioners wouldn't allow the railroad to cross over uh, uh, against main central's objections. They said, you could go over, you could go under, but you can't cross this at grade. So um, the railroad didn't have enough money really to, you know, build all that. So it uh, cut, its, cut it back to Albion, which became the northernmost point of the railroad, some roughly 40, 42 miles from Wisconsin. One of the um, issues the railroad had, um, as I mentioned, it had financial issues, was uh, they had uh, sold stock in it. And many of the subscribers, including George Crosby, the leading subscriber, um, didn't pony up their money when it came time to, uh, to buy the stock. So that um, led to a reorganization. The railroad was ori originally called the Wiscasset Quebec, which was to be the both ends of the railroad. And it was reorganized as the uh, WWNF, the Wiscasset Waterville and Farmington Railway. They then had a new goal uh, to connect with the Sydney River and Rangeley Lakes at Farmington. So the railroad at um, Weeks Mills split off and headed towards um, Winslow, which was on the eastern side of the Kennebec River. Um, it got that far, but never built a bridge over the river. 
Um, a branch was um, actually commenced um, on, the, on the other side of the river uh, by the Franklin um, Construction Company, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of the railroad. It actually built right away, um, put down track, it built some bridges almost all the way into, into Farmington. In fact, you can still see some vestiges of it in Farmington. However, the main central at that time was um, the owner or majority owner of the Sandy River. And again, seeing the WWF as competition uh, didn't allow them to connect up with the Sandy River. So uh, trains never ran on that branch, which was uh, what's called the Franklin Somerset and Kennebec Railroad. So it only ran as far as Winslow. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, a few years after it, it cut back to Weeks Mills for lack of business. And this is one of the bridges um, on the uh, Farmington side of the river. So the railroad never was much of a money maker. And in fact, was a money loser all but one or two years. And in 1933, uh, there was a, a derailment uh, in Whitefield. You can hear, you can see the derailment picture of it. Number eight went off the track and the um, railroad called it quits at that point. It closed shortly thereafter and one of the creditors, I think it was the Sherman Williams Paint Company, um, came in and uh, ripped up the rail to, to pay unpaid bills and brought everything down to, uh, down to Wiscasset where all the scrapping took place. During the scrapping period, um, a group came along, um, a group of gentlemen, uh, rail fans actually, uh, a man by the name of Frank Ramsdell. Oh, before I leave this page, I wanted to show you, this is the Luther, uh, Luther Little and Hesper, which were ships bought by um, the WWNF's owner who um, had hoped to move lumber down from the Sheepskid Valley and ship it off, they, which they did for a while. But um, if any of you had uh, back in the, as late as the 90s had driven up Route 1 and through Wiscasset, you would have seen the, the vestiges of these two um, schooners sitting there. Number nine, is the last remaining locomotive of the railroad. Um, locomotive nine was uh, purchased by Frank Ramsdell and William Moneypenny and a couple of other gentlemen from, from the scrappers and moved to uh, West Thompson, Connecticut where Frank had hoped to, um, to build a little backyard amusement park such as Edaville. Um, which uh, opened a few years after that. Um, it stayed there for many years under his, um, got under his care and then under his daughter, Alice Ramsdell. If um, any of you are in the Maine or Connecticut area, there is a um, DVD that's currently circulating being shown on PBS called The Nine Lives of Number Nine, which talks about number nine. Um, it ultimately ends up at the WWNF Railroad where we are today. It's a, it's a great story. I think you can find it on the web as well. Uh, this is Harry Percival. He's the founder of the museum. Uh, he grew up along the railroad. Actually, he first um, grew up along the right of way in, um, in Head Tide, where his parents brought a, brought a house right along the right of way. As a young child, he had this dream to rebuild the railroad. And in fact, started, he took some of his father's wood and set them out as ties on the right of way until his father got word of that, found out about it, and put a, put a stop to that. Um, Harry was a very passionate man, and many of us have dreams as childhood, uh, in our childhood, but, you know, we put them away and go on to adult life. Harry never did. He had the fire that burned in him like so many entrepreneurs. Along the way, as he became an adult, he found that the, uh, the W and Q, the Wisconsin Quebec Railroad, had never been dissolved either by the stockholders or by the state of Maine. So he called, he called the state house and they told him, well, if you call the meeting of the shareholders, you can revive uh, the railroad, uh, and, which he did. And there were still some stockholders living in the area and they showed up and uh, 
Harry bought some of the remaining stock because people said, wow, this is worthless. You know, this crazy man wants to buy it. We'll, we'll take it. So he did and started the Sheepscot Valley Railroaders. <clears throat> Their goal um, was to reach head tide by, uh, by February 20th, 1995, which was the centennial of the railroad. Um, quite a lofty goal. He didn't quite make it in that time period. In fact, it's not quite there, but we're that close. We're about a half mile away. In control the right away. There's just, we just have to cross one street. So the, the railroad was organized in the late 80s and really started um, building in the about, about 1995 or so, 1996. And on this page here there are a few buildings. This is the uh, a replica of the station at Sheepscut, which is now a different color. Flat car 118 was um, also purchased by Frank Ramsdell and sat in his barn for many years um, through the generosity of his nephew who inherited all the equipment, uh, Dale King. Um, this equipment was repatriated, I guess you could call, to the WWF. And Flat Car 118, which was used to rip up the railroad by the Sherman Williams Company, was used by our museum to rebuild the railroad after we rebuilt it. Um, this box car here also was at Frank's um, farm and was rebuilt by our, um, by our craftsmen in our shops. The, um, I can't see underneath here, but I believe right there is a, a, that's a replica of the Weeks Mills um, water tower, which we've rebuilt to um, water our steam locomotives. Coach number three is original to the railroad and was bought by LSD Atwood and ran at Edaville Railroad for a while and then was moved up to uh, the main narrow gauge museum in Portland and ultimately leased and then purchased by us. This is the station as it, at Sheepscut as it appears today. This um, right here is the um, freight house uh, it, that is a replica of the one at, at um, Weeks Mills where the two-story tower was. We've built a car barn for storage within the last couple of years. And this is, that's number nine, which is now uh, after being a 15 year uh -huh. restoration and reboiling, reboilering, um, now is our main um, local, main motive power. We built a replica turntable. It's a replica of the one that was in Wiscasset. Um, built with Doug Fur from, from Washington State. So, and this is uh, the bridge that um, Pete mentioned earlier, which served on the um, Gorham branch of the Boston and Maine Railroad up in New Hampshire. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> so our rebirth started here at Sheepscut. Harry built a home right here and purchased much of the land around here. And through um, his um, tenacity, and I, I have to say brilliance, he acquired about half of the original um, right-of-way, non-contiguous of the railroad of roughly 40 miles. So he owns or owned roughly 20 miles. And of this, we have built rail from Sheepscut to Trotbrook Preserve, which is at Route, route 218. Um, this is roughly 3.2 miles and another half mile brings us to head tide. So this all right now has track on it. We plan to open the, um, what we call our mountain extension uh, next August. We, we had traditionally built track in um, essentially 900 to 1200 feet increments um, during our spring track line weekends. And we would then ballast and uh, tamp it in our fall work, work weekends. Um, when we got to the mountain, uh, due to the um, grade, which is, reaches almost 4% at its uh, maximum steepness, um, we decided that we would build the entire section before we opened it. This is roughly, here is roughly 2.6 miles from Sheepskit. Now I'll talk a little bit about current affairs. So the mountain extension I spoke of um, was done in, done in sections and we had um, to do um, a, not just the construction work, but it in, involved uh, permitting with the Corps of Engineers, um, state DEP, 
and with um, the local um, shoreland zoning, which was the, through the planning board and the fields board. Um, that actually was the most difficult. The Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of it was by right due to the distance you can see um, here where the Trout Brook is very close to the, uh, the right-of-way. This is actually, the right-of-way is probably 40 or 50 feet above the river, but um, unfortunately the 75 feet doesn't run vertical. So what's, what's kind of neat about this is that the mountain extension illustrates what's great about using a narrow gauge because instead of just bulldozing a tangent, the original railroad built along the curves um, of the mountain. So when you go, it's, it's just a wonderful experience. It's, we left it as wooded as we could, even though our right of way is um, up to 66 uh, feet or four rods in some places. So it, it, you can see how the, the, the track just hugs, hugs, the, um, hugs the mountainside. Uh, if it had to have been con, uh, constructed on a tangent, it, there would have been a lot of cut and fill and the like, and the railroad avoided a lot of that. So we did a lot of the work ourselves and also had a local contractor, Jeff Fernie, um, who had some heavy equipment and he, he along with our volunteers, um, put in some of the riprap and whatnot that we needed. Here you can see my job is just to kind of observe and make sure things are, are going well. Due to the um, sharp, steep drop-offs, um, we had to come up with a way to lay rail. The way we we lay rail like it was my, we figure it was done back in 1910. All by hand, you get a, a anywhere from eight to 15 guys on a stick of rail um, after we all lay out the ties by hand. Uh, we then each grab the rail, move it off a little cart, bring it at real length, lay it down, bring the other one down. And then we have something we call Instatrack where we bolt them together and then run a temporary um, uh, cart over it with, with the next piece of rails. Meanwhile, the rails being bolted together and safety spiked down. Because um, it was so close and the, 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 um, the drop-off was so steep, um, our railroad superintendent, Jason LaMontagne, came up with this idea of building a, a, a gantry crane, which sits on a flat car and feeds off a second flat car. So we have a little trolley, brings it out, you drop the rail there. So it's uh, um, much safer. The interesting thing about this is that this, the steel in this was not its first job. When we built the, um, this bridge, right, when we put together the bridge, it came in parts. We had to, oh, I'll get, I'll get back to that, I'll go back to that later. Um, we had to figure out a way to how to get the bridge onto the river. What we did was we built this bridge in, our, in the sheep scrap parking lot, um, narrowed it about two feet from its standard gauge so it looked more in scale, and then um, hooked a um, military five-ton tractor to it and a set of wheels on the back that had um, a steerable uh, hydraulic um, system and drove it all the way down Route 218, roughly four miles, and then back to the, a half mile, excuse me, a thousand feet um, down the right-of-way, which we had we had prepared, and this was used as a temporary bridge. We drove it over the temporary bridge, set the bridge down, and then ultimately removed the um, what became a crane. These are just some some shots of the work that was done. We had to build a retaining wall. We had to put in some heavy culverts. Um, all all done by hand. You can. This is. When this first happened, this happened probably the mid 2000s, uh, it just washed out. We had a lot of rain and the, the vegetation hadn't been cut, the trees, and it just one day just completely collapsed. I don't know how many truckloads of um, gravel and rock went into this, but um, it was one of the big expenses that we had. This is what Troutbrook looked like the year before this bridge was here. This is literally about 365 days. The uh, mountain extension required 12 culverts, one precast concrete retaining wall, four washout repairs, two ditching repairs, and a host of other activity.
Oh. The, uh, I, I have to thank the Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges um, who donated that bridge to us. It's what's called a Howe Pony Trust Bridge. Um, while one such bridge never existed on the WWNF, um, one actually was used in the village of Headtide um, for uh, motor vehicles and L at the time wagons, I guess. Um, one of our members, and this is the, one of the, the great things about the WWNF, whenever we need somebody or something, uh, a volunteer or someone just seems to appear out of nowhere. Um, we would never have known about the bridge, except one of our members um, is a bridge inspector by trade and happened to be up in New Hampshire and heard about it, knew about it, and um, told us we filed a, um, uh, an RFP for the organization that owned it because they were unable to use the bridge, um, the Preservation Society, and they um, were very pleased that steam would run over it. And so we, um, we won the RFP. Of course, there was only one other entity we were competing against. While it may be 2022 here, it's always 1910 in Sheepskit. Um, we do things the old fashioned way. This, we, spike our rail and lay everything out by hand. And that's, I think, one of the things that our volunteers really, really like. We, in fact, we were able, uh, even through COVID, we were able to um, prepare the track on the, and ballast the track on the mountain extension. The, we're gonna put a station which never existed at Troutbrook because, you know, we're not gonna cross the street yet. It will be a replica of the station that was at Allen Center, which is a replica right now. So we've uh, installed the um, groundwork for a turntable, which we are going to um, borrow from the main narrow gauge um, railroad museum. We have the, uh, the base in it for it now, and it should be uh, installed sometime as soon as the weather breaks in the spring. <clears throat> The other thing, other work that we've been doing at Tropbrook is um, the land on either side of us for, from the bridge north, which is you know, 1,000, 1,500 feet, um, the land on either side is owned by the main Midcoast uh, Conservancy. And uh, we have partnered with them to um, improve their trails um, so that they can safely cross over our railroad and um, make it available to the public. We've started running trains, um, which we call rails to the trails and bringing people, they ride the steam train and then go hike and the steam train picks them up later in the day. <clears throat> As the railroad's grown, we've, we, we find a, a great need for infrastructure. Um, you know, there's this, uh, some sort of truism that when you, you know, you build it, you fill it, and, and it's been very true at us. Work right now is underway of a replica three-stall engine house, which will abut the turntable. Um, it's a little more progressed than this. The walls are all in, and some of the, um, some of the other work is done. Um, the weather kind of, kind of pre um, prevented us from going any further. So our number nine, which is, a, again, an original locomotive from the railroad, number 10, which we acquired from the owner of it when it was at Edaville. It was never owned by Edaville. It was an old sugarcane um, locomotive that was, I think, 30 inches, uh, was regaged to two. And we're rebuilding a replica of number seven, which we will number in the same sequence um, that the original railroad used. So it will become our number 11. Um, as we've grown, we, our utilities have gotten a little out of control, and in order to get that um, under control, we've built an um, electrical shed to uh, enable us to um, underground all our electric. So we're, we'll have one line in, we'll come to a pole here, and the entire campus, will, uh, the electricity will be underground. We also put in you know, internet service, phone service, um, and the like. As, as we've grown, we've realized that in order to um, sustain ourselves, we can't just run trains and you know, be, a, be a 
tourist railroad for people. So our thinking has turned so that we are going to, we want to be a service to the valley, just like the original railroad was. So we have partnered with um, a local farm, Sea Lions Farm. We run events, pumpkin trains, uh, Christmas trains. This year we'll do Christmas tree trains if um, um, the lions are able to um, get Christmas trees. They, they couldn't do it this year. There was actually a shortage of trees. Um, and this, uh, we were offered, one of our members is a member of the Maine Maritime Museum. And this pavilion was used there to rebuild the Mary E, to restore the Mary E, which is a, a, a schooner that sails on the Kennebec River now. And it was, they, due to the um, zoning laws or shoreland zoning, I guess, actually more properly laws in Bath, um, they were unable to keep this uh, pavilion there. Um, so they had to, had to move it. So they offered it to us and we went down there, took it apart and then rebuilt it here. Um, we are very big on accuracy, um, historic accuracy. And there was some grumbling in the ranks about, you know, well, you know what are you building this? There was never this there. Um, then one of our board members was looking in, I think it was two feet to tidewater and saw that our building looks ex almost exactly like a corn canning shed up at Albion. So just through pure coincidence. So uh, we're hoping to use this. We've already used it for concerts um, last summer. It was, it was finally completed. And we hope to rent this out for weddings, event, you know, events and, and the like. Um, this year, the um, Masons will use it for their induction ceremony. So they'll take the train and use this. As I mentioned earlier, one of our other projects is um, to build number 11. Um, number seven was a 28 ton 244 T40 that was built for the railroad and was damaged in a round roundhouse fire and then scrapped in 1937. Um, many of us feel that number seven was, was one of the most beautiful locomotives on the original railroad. And I'm guessing 10, 15 years ago, uh, it became a dream to build our own locomotive. And a number of things kept us from, from really go, getting very far with it. Number one was the restoration of number nine. Um, and, and number 10 needed some work as well. It's currently getting a, a new boiler. So in the, in the background, we have a couple of members who are pattern makers, started making patterns for this. And it's really kind of now reaching a point where we're actually going to start assembly uh, in bay two of our car shop, which would, should start within two to three months. We're probably five years away from it, um, uh, from actually having it run, but um, we're, I'm seeing enough uh, parts laying around. We've bought a couple of um, storage containers in a storage shed so that we can keep all the parts that are now accumulating um, so that they'll all be ready when we're ready to, ready to build it. I mentioned our number 10, <coughs> it's currently receiving um, a new boiler in partnership with Maine Locomotive Works, which is um, a business alongside our railroad, Brian Fanslaw, who's um, railroad superintendent down at the Maine, Maine Narrow Gauge, has his own business. We built a siding onto his uh, property where he stores much of some of the Maine Narrow Gauge stuff, equipment, excuse me. While we've, you know, motive power is exciting, we found that um, we need passenger um, accommodations. We have, you know, we've converted flat cars or used converted flat cars and we have coach number three, but, you know, good, good quality passenger um, cars we didn't have. So about a year ago, we undertook to build a, um, a coach again, in the same numbering se sequence, coach number nine, um, the exterior has been completed and we're now working towards, um, the, it, the car has been moved out of its, uh, where it was initially built into um, our wood shop where the uh, fitting of oak and mahogany will take place and windows and whatnot um, in, in our wood shop. Main narrow gauge has had a, surplus of, of equipment that they couldn't use that was deteriorating down the waterfront. And they very generously donated some um, 
some of their equipment, surplus equipment to us, which we are in the process of rebuilding. This is boxcar number 56, which um, actually served as the, I believe the only livestock car on the original railroad. We're going to outfit it as a tool car so that when we're way out on the line, we don't have to keep running back for tools that we forgot. We'll just take them all with us. Um, if you build track, you got to take care of it. Um, we had our own in-house, still have it, um, jury rig, Rube Goldberg machine made of four different machines, a, a, a pallet loader, a forklift, a compressor that we call Big Joe um, that we used. Um, it, it, all it does is tamp. So one of our members um, searched literally around the world and found a surplus um, tamper in Australia that was owned by the Wilmar Sugar. The sugarcane plantations in Australia um, use two foot gauge equipment. And in fact, I believe Wilmar has um, about 200 miles um, plus or minus. So we negotiated with them and they very generously agreed to um, donate it to us, except that we had to pick it up from, um, from Australia. So um, we hired a uh, expediter who got it to Brisbane, got it on a ship, went through the Panama Canal, um, and in, through the miracle of the internet, we were able to track its progress. So it was, um, and, and in honor of Wilmar, we named it Wilmar. It needs a, a complete rebuild. It sat out in the Australian sun for over 10 years without being operated. So, but this one will align, lift, and of course, tamp. We're, we're very pleased with this. Of course, I had to test it as soon as it got off the truck. Um, this was our first locomotive. It ran it as a bog locomotive. Um, I believe 10 or 15 of them were built by the Brookville Company. And um, this ran on Cape Cod. It was used at, as, as a, uh, at a marine railway. And very early on, be before my involvement, was donated to the museum. And most of the early construction was all um, done with this locomotive. Uh, it recently underwent a uh, complete rebuild and we'll be using it again. We found a need, uh, since our equipment was starting to deteriorate, we, um, we needed a car barn. So uh, we built one a few years ago. This is the older section here. It's roughly a hundred feet long. And um, when Maine narrow gauge lost its, um, its lease, so to speak, for indoor storage um, in Portland, um, they approached us and we generously um, and they generously um, contributed and built an extension on here. We're going to, this was enable us to put in the, some of their very, very viable equipment, which needs to be housed inside. And this will be an exhibit, this little um, bump out here will be an exhibit that we hope to um, show how, you know, narrow gauge is a good alternative to standard gauge. <clears throat> so, um, a couple of years ago, actually it was about this time of year, um, we, we met with the folks at Maine Narrow Gauge and with um, Maine Locomotive and Machinery and reached an agreement whereby the, uh, much of the, their valuable equipment would be stored at Sheepscut, which we call the Narrow Gauge Collection. This is uh, the Rangeley, the world's only two foot parlor car, which is in absolutely original condition, has never been refurbished, nothing. Um, we're, um, under discussions, uh, sort of loose discussions with me and Eric, as to, you know, how, what we're going to do to preserve this. And this spring, we, well, recently we got a, a grant um, that will allow us to uh, retain somebody to um, tell us how, what we should do and how we should go about this. Um, the Sandy River and Ranger Lakes Combine 14, their Caboose 32, Coach 16, Mount Pleasant, um, and locomotive number eight, along with locomotive number four, currently um, at Sheepscut. Both locomotive and, and look eight and number four will be returning to the Portland area where they are going to be restored by main narrow gauge. A few, probably six, seven years ago, we um, built a replica car, um, dairy car, Turner Center dairy, Turner Center a dairy car. All our new equipment has always had new numbers in the sequence attached. 
this is the first one we built as a replica uh, because we felt it was appropriate. And it sits for much of the year on the waterfront in Wiscasset and has a revolving series of, of displays um, in it so that the public can learn about us on the water on the waterfront. COVID has made us um, really kind of pivot uh, in order to, to, to stay alive. Uh, and we've gone to online ticketing. Um, we've reduced our schedule to one day a weekend um, and we've branded much of our um, much of our things, such as um, uh, pumpkin trains, uh, lavender trains to sea lions farms. Um, we have World War I reenactors um, come in in uh, August to the group that we have the land, they have the, they have the soldiers. So that's worked out, that's worked out very well. Our uh, <clears throat> partnership with the Mids Coast Conservancy as well has gone very well. I'm used to talking a lot, but not this much, <clears throat> sorry. We also, as we mature, we've learned again that you just can't run trains, that people have to know you are. We're in the middle of nowhere up in Maine. And so, um, cur not curiously, I suppose, but there are people even in Wiscasset that don't know we exist. So we've worked on uh, branding, branding our, our, our identity. And I told you people just sort of drop out of the sky for us. Um, recently, we uh, just before Christmas, we did a, um, a charter for a group of people and the a leader of it was so impressed. He, he um, mentioned me, he said, you know, I've, um, I spent a whole career in the automobile industry um, in branding, and I'd love to help you people um, get better at this. Um, he had actually written a book, um, which he gave to me and I read. And um, so we're hopeful that we'll, um, we'll go somewhere from there. We've learned that branding is different from marketing, which is, I don't know that much of us gave much thought about, but if it's what you do for a living, it, it means something. So um, that's currently in its um, early stages. Already he's ruffled a few feathers. He says, you know, your name, it doesn't tell much about you. You're not in Wiscasset, you're not in Waterville, and you're not in Farmington. So he said, no, nah, nah, we're not gonna change the name. We'll change our, our tagline, but that's about it. <clears throat> I've mentioned partnerships, uh, Sea Lion Farm, Mid Coast Conservancy, main uh, narrow gauge, uh, the town of Alna and the town of Wiscasset, we've uh, also worked with Wiscasset with letting us put our, um, our box car, on, our, um, our Turner, the dairy car, excuse me, on the waterfront. In the town of Alna, we, um, we have an Alna day when we let all Alna residents ride the train for free and local craftsmen come in. And in fact, the town, our, our relations are so good that um, a, uh, beloved town resident died recently and his, um, he left his uh, Ford uh, tractor, uh, 1954 Ford tractor to the town and the town had no place to do it. And so they've entrusted its care to us. It takes a lot of people to run a railroad and um, we're an all volunteer organization. We have one contractor that is paid for by a few of our members um, who's there two or three days a week, but everything else is volunteer. I, I've never been involved in an organization that is, has such enthusiasm. Um, Pete mentioned earlier that a lot of this, a lot of things happened under my watch since I've been president. Um, none of it, absolutely none of it would have happened without our volunteers. I just sort of heard the cats. I, there's, and even that I'm not very good at. <clears throat> but um, our members are, are just, just intensely loyal, both monetarily and with their time. Where are we headed? The future of narrow gauge in Sheepscot Valley. Um, as I mentioned, um, we're a nonprofit, maybe I didn't, we're a nonprofit. Um, we're currently discussing sustainability, preservation. And by sustainability, I mean monetarily, to be able to survive beyond the lives of the volunteers that we have now. Um, we're getting old, you know, and I'm one of maybe medium, maybe more towards the younger ones um, right now. We, we do um, all that we can to um, bring in young folks. Uh, you know, if you bring your kids to the museum, we'll give them a cab ride. We, uh, we're very open with the campus. We don't, there are really no places that are off limits to anybody. Uh, we've been very lucky, knock on wood, um, that 
you know, people haven't been injured or anything. We just tell them, you know, it's a real railroad, be careful. And uh, the public seems to have really, um, really enthused, uh, been enthused about that. Um, I, I think I'd just like to read directly to what our, our mission statement is. The Wiscasset Waterville and Farmington Railway Museum is a nonprofit organization established in 1989 to acquire, preserve, and restore the operation of narrow gauge railroads and equipment, which operate in the Sheepscot Valley and on other roads, and to establish a museum for the display of artifacts for enlightenment and education of the general public concerning the social and economic impact of railroads in the community served. We take that very seriously, and we have various committees and the like to make sure that we hold to that mission. We want to be a service to the Sheepscot Valley and not a burden. Our campus has grown. Um, here's just an, an overview of it. Um, we have some ideas about where we're headed. Uh, we need an archives for, our, for what we have. We, we, as we've grown, people have realized that we should be the repository of their family heirlooms that relate to the railroad. And you, you'll be there on a Saturday and someone will stop by and say, my dad had this in the barn. I think you guys should have it. So we want to make sure that we have a proper place to display that. Um, we've gone through, I wouldn't say fits and starts, but a lot of discussions about what we should make our archives look like. And then a couple of our members hit, out, hit upon the idea of, since we, we try to be historically accurate, let's find a building that is. And a potato house seems to be exactly what we need, exactly our size. We can have a, a conference room and it will, we'll put it in our, our parking lot. Uh, in, as I showed back, whoop, oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, geez, getting ahead of myself, sorry about that. Um, which will be right here on the edge of our parking lot. This is the lower parking lot and we have additional parking up here. We're a few years off from that. Um, we're going to have to do some fundraising for that. We, we have actually have to finish what we started. <coughs> there has been talk, um, there's always idle talk, of um, moving uh, another half to three quarters of a mile um, beyond our current end of track to head tide. We, that would ideally fit into our sustainability in that head tide is a, um, is a destination for a lot of tourists in the area. It's a very historically accurate village. Um, it looks today much like it did uh, 120 years ago. We either own or have an easement over the right of way. The only thing is the physically right at head tide where we would, where we would put a station if we would be able to do that. Um, we also, in terms of having things for people to do, we've been gifted um, actually three sawmills and a shingle in a shingle mill. We hope to erect some uh, buildings at uh, top of the mountain um, and saw our own wood and make our own shingles. Once coach number nine is finished, we will then restore coach number three. Coach number nine is an exact replica of what this originally was. Imagine if you will, that the date is June 11th, 2033. Southbound train has just cleared the mountain. It is now headed towards southward towards Alma Center. A hundred years ago, an accident occurred that would have sealed the railway's fate under all reasonable circumstances. Yet through the passion and vision of many dedicated to a common goal, the railway of big dreams and little wheels has come out against the odds. Will this train complete the trip that was cut short a hundred years earlier? After pulling into Sheepscut Station, will the conductors call boom, next stop, Sheep's good. Learn a little more. Um, you can order the two feet to tide water from our, um, our gift shop. It tells, tells the whole story uh, of the railroad. And these are a number of other books. If you want to become a member, just go to our website. It's only $35 a year or $350 if you want to become a life member. Um, I took a phone call one day from a 94-year-old man who wanted, to, wanted a life membership. I said, that's the definition of an optimist. <laughs> he, was, he was a hot ticket um, or join us come volunteer these are um, some of our these both is Dan and Bryce came to us as 12 or 13 year olds um, they're now into their 20s um, they're coming Bryce they're both now operate they're both farming on our, our 
steam locomotives and uh, are now leading crews of their own. Uh, the museum needs young people to grow if we want to sustain and continue on. Uh, we're physically located at 97 Cross Road in Alma. Don't listen to your um, your GPS. It's it's wrong. You have to take a left instead of a right when you get to Cross Road. This is um, one of our younger members. His father is a, has bought, his parents, I should say, bought land right next to Alma Center. Imagine growing up next to a little railroad like ours. He, is, he already speaks and knows more about steam locomotives than I do. Um, these are just some pictures um, along the line. Number nine, pulling a passenger consist. Um, watering number 10. This is at Rosewood Crossing. You know, we built the railroad through here. We never realized it, but the photographer's eye saw this tree and said, this is a great photographic spot. <coughs> Our young members, here's Dan again. Joe Fox came as a young boy, probably when he was 10. Um, now, uh, I think he's steam qualified. And this is um, Alan Downey, uh, who moved from Austin, Texas um, to be with us and lives up in Maine now. His father is the one who does a lot of pattern making for us and has been helping with the um, with coach number nine. Alan is a pattern maker and machinist in his own right. He's, he's our shop um, foreman. 1910 or 2021. You be the judge. And I spoke earlier of how we do things by hand. This is how we move the rail. This was a reenactment we used with the flat car number 118 was used to, was pulled by a set of horses, a draft horses. And when we had to replace the rail along the Davis grade, which was roughly where um, there's a famous picture of those horses pulling the flat car we decided we hold it, held a photographer special and hired a local pair of Percherons, Bill and Bob, to uh, pull the flat car for us. That was a cool day. And these are the World War I reenactors visiting us. They brought their own photographer. A couple of Fords. We had one of our members built a um, track car, a Model T flat car, a uh, track car, excuse me, that is um, a, almost an exact replica of what ran on the railroad. And that's it. Well, thank Dave, you very much. Thank you, Dave. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, that's, that's really some exciting stuff that's going on. Uh, we had uh, uh, Robin Peel was saying that uh, he was surprised that you had a, found a two foot tamper. And uh, Dave Adams mm -hmm. mentions uh, the Jukes tree in Maine. Is that the name of the tree that you showed on the slide? Is that what it is? I, I have no idea. I, you know, I, I walked by and I saw that's a tall tree. You know, it just never occurred to me. It just, no, and I, now I, it's a, um, you know, the, the photographers on, always want us to do run-bys there. Yeah. yeah, the comment on Juke's tree is, is right outside uh, east of, uh, railroad east of Chama is is a tree that uh, was made famous by Fred Jukes, who was a oh, railroad oh, employee okay. and a photographer, and that's okay. known as Juke's tree. And it's just about identical to the photo that you showed there it's a tree with a railroad side where you're missing branches part way up and it's just i just looked at that and said yep we've got one one out here in the rocky mountains and another one back in maine that's great <laughs> yeah we, we love it when the photographers come because they always see the railroad through different eyes mm -hmm. you know i see it from from the track you know either riding on it being a brakeman mm -hmm. working on it or whatever and they'll climb into the woods, climb down and, you know, down to, to the river or something like that, to Hummus and Brook. And the pictures they post are just absolutely phenomenal. I go, wow, I never knew my railroad was that be beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have uh, three more comments here. Awesome. Very interesting. Thanks, Dave. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Uh, we're running a little bit late, so we need Sorry. to get on with it. And uh, if uh, you hang around for another hour, Dave, uh, we'll maybe have some more questions generate in the after uh, action. Uh, sure, thanks again for the a wonderful presentation. Russ, I'll turn it back to you. 